Hey, what's up everybody? Rob Marzullo here, Ram Studio Comics. Welcome back. So today's live stream, uh, like many of them, you'll dictate and you can tell me what you'd like to see drawn, what you'd like to learn. Uh, I'll start with Clip Studio Paint. Uh, we can jump into a different program if we need to, but uh, essentially I'm going to let you guys uh, tell me what you'd like to see. So first off, I do want to make an announcement. We've got a new website, so if you can, check it out. Let me know what you think. This is a WordPress site, so you guys are welcome to comment and you know on each post and things like that. So it's RamStudioComics.com, and this will not only be a portfolio for my work, but also a resource center for aspiring artists. So a lot of times with my YouTube channel and with my various uh, endeavors, what I do here to try to show the artwork, I get requests to not only see people's artwork, but to you know interact with it in a way and, and give feedback mentorship different things like that so essentially this will kind of facilitate that you can even submit uh, images through here and I can you know take a look at them and things like that uh, but that'll all kind of evolve as uh, the site gets some time spent and I get some feedback from you guys so be sure to check it out let me know what you think uh, it's right there so clip studio paint uh, manga studio and I've got the Blackstone comic open, so if you guys want to see me do some ink work or, you know, touch up a panel, we could do that. Uh, or we could just go ahead and go for drawing something new. Uh, I'll start scribbling over here just till we get some people in the live stream and figure out what direction we want to take. Uh, let's see, and we already got a couple people, and I misspelled the title. Did I really? Oh, I did. Nice call there. Yeah, spelling is not my strong suit. I was drawn when I should have been paying attention in spelling class. That's not even right. Okay, session. Yeah, I misspelled session. God, that's pretty bad. And you can see why I closed my sign shop down. I had a sign shop for 15 years, and uh, yeah, I kept misspelling things. It was horrible. All right, so what do we got here? Oh, we got Master Zemus. Yo, yo, what's up, man? Uh, hi, Master. How you doing? <laughs> nice. Um, is this where we're gonna have critiques um, no not this isn't gonna be a critique session uh, you know we need to set that up a little bit further so as I just mentioned in the live stream I hate to be redundant but uh, just so you guys are aware I've got rampstudiocomics.com now and we'll probably do the critiques through there where I'll have people submit because I was having people submit their work through Facebook through Twitter different things and it was just getting a mess it's hard for me to uh, you know get it all together and it, it needs to be in one unified kind of format so we'll use the website for that you guys can submit your work we'll do a uh, critique session that way it'll be a lot easier to um, orchestrate okay um, yeah so you guys start to give me your ideas of what you'd like to see um, once Spartan saying could you draw a futuristic suit ish thing um, yeah I could do that um, Actually, that's not a bad idea, really. So uh, I'll start with that, and then if we, uh, you know, delve into some other things, so be it. Um, and then uh, the nameless one, or nameless, is saying, how do you learn drawing? I know practice, practice, but what other, what other tips do you have for us? Uh, it, it is just, it just does come down to practice, but it's it also comes down to, uh, you know, practicing the right things at the right times and working up your your uh, your stuff in a certain way. So, for instance, uh, you guys wanted to see like a futuristic suit thing. I'll, I'll itemize this and I'll say just an arm so we don't have to draw out a full character, which would take a little bit uh, too long to get to the detail portion. So, for instance, like when you're going to draw something, uh, you know, an arm's not really complex, but there's a few things to it to make it look like an arm. So, what you do is you break down the shapes and, you know, you study individual components so, you know, if you're struggling getting the bicep right, maybe you study that area. Uh, if you're studying to get the form the right shape, maybe you study that area. So it's, I think it's more like breaking things down at the right intervals and then figuring out what it is you need to get better at at that particular time. So, like I always talk about that, like when you see somebody else's work and it really hits home for you, and you look at it and you go, man, that's amazing. They do their, uh, their female faces are, are perfect or whatever. Um, it's probably meaning that you're you're really uh, res it's resonating with you because you need to study that it's something that you're maybe lacking in your own work so you're entirely impressed when you see it done really well um, 
like for instance, there's a, a girl on DeviantArt that does these amazing uh, face shots. Uh, her, I think she goes by Gabby D70, so you can check out her work. And she does these really amazing, uh, just the proportions, the dynamics of the face are just really spot on. So I always study her work for that particular component. I think it's just really well done, and I think I got a lot to learn from that. You know, so it's uh, and, and likewise when you go to study, um, you know, like we're gonna do. A futuristic kind of um, arm here but at first I want to get the basic shapes in place I always think of like the way Jim Lee does this perfect proportions from the forearm to the shoulder to the bicep you know he gets it all just really dynamic looking I wouldn't say it's it's accurate to real life but it's just really well done and so he's got these really great proportions and you know it's Jim Lee he does everything amazing when it comes to comic art um, so what I'll do is I'll take this I'll blue line it right and then I'll draw, so I wanted this foundation, so this basic arm, to draw something kind of techy and modern over it. Now, when you go to do, like, futuristic armor, obviously there's just so many different things you could do. Uh, I might just take this initial shape and then draw some kind of, I don't know, I'll keep some of the look of, a, of an arm in there. But then I'll try to change it as much as possible and do some techy little indents and shapes and things like that in there. Uh, I also try to think about like the way that the the uh, arm of this uh, mechanical monstrosity might move. So I try to do the little separations where it would bend and fold as well. You know, so I try to think about a little bit of functionality, but you know, not so much functionality. It's style first when you're doing something animated like this, I think. But you want a little bit of form and function in there as well. So I just do like these little indents and different things, and I don't know. I just, again, I'm still sketching at this stage to kind of make something that I think might look cool. I'm almost thinking a little bit uh, Iron Iron Man-esque or something. Um, you know, I always like the way the suit designs are for that character, and, you know, they throw in all these little cool indents and, and openings. And, you know, what's neat about this type of stuff, you can think about, you know, maybe there's an opening here, maybe that lights up, so when you go to color it, you can do something cool there. You do these little flares, and, and you know, you could almost picture, like, where, uh, you know, maybe a blast of energy can come out of some of these things. You know, so, so you can just be really imaginative when doing this type of stuff. There's really no rules when it comes to this. Okay, let me read a couple of these comments now. I uh, don't know if it's a problem on my side, but it seems that it doesn't look normal on your website. I don't know what you get, you're getting at that. Are you saying the uh, the new website that I just posted to, it doesn't look right? Uh, yeah, it's frustrating to see artists' very nice work when you don't have the same quality in your drawings. Yeah, it just comes with time and, and practice. Um, do you know or recommend a good PDF or book for anatomy? Um for anatomy, I always recommend Bern Hogarth's books. I don't know if they come in PDF form, but they're really great for dynamic anatomy. And let's see, and then uh, Sifters recommended Michael Hampton, Figure Drawing, Design, and Invention. I haven't checked that out yet, um, but I probably need to. You can't ever have enough anatomy books, in my opinion. And then one more, I'll read one more and get back to the drawing. Oh, Rob, can you draw several torso shots and explain how you go about it? I know everyone has their way, but I'd like to know uh, know how. Okay. Um, yeah, let's finish up uh, a little bit of this sketch here. Because I want to show you guys how I would take this a, a little bit further. And then we'll jump on torsos. Okay, so essentially, you know, I'll get this to about here. And then, you know, maybe start adding in a little bit of uh, specularity and things like that. So I would think like, all right, we'll kind of surfaces is how reflective is it things like that uh, i might start dropping out the previous blue line sometimes i don't i'll just tone it back i actually like keeping as much information in the sketch as possible uh, and then keep working up from there so add a new layer draw over top and refine it a little bit further get in some some line weight type stuff keep picking at it and changing it you know it's always it's always a work in progress as I'm sketching, so I just, every time I redraw, I try to add a little bit more to it. Uh, and then as soon as I run out of ideas uh, to add to it, I go to rendering. At least that's the, uh, the process I take. 
And as far as this, like I said, specularity, I would probably do, you know, really, uh, I, would, I tend to make stuff like this look overly, like, chromey and swirls and things like that. Um, which, again, is a style choice because, you know, I always, always think about, in reality, if this thing did exist, it'd probably be pretty beat up and tattered and, and dingy. But I always, I always tend to make everything look all shiny and, and brand new. At least that's my thought process. Yeah, so, and, you know, it's real easy to kind of get a chromey look just by doing, like, I don't know, I always look at it like a thick line and a bunch of swirling thin lines. And then you can do little bits of, um, you know, like line breaks and shadows. So just little stuff like this. You can do a little, like, swirl right through the middle. You know, whatever. This, again, this is just style. So it's it's depends on how you want that to look. And then here I'd probably do like you know, these little uh, straight lines and then shade to each side like that. It's a quick way to kind of do a little techie looking thing like that. And I think the best way to get good at this stuff is to study robotics and machinery and then just incorporate small amounts of that into your style choices as you're creating it. And uh, you should be able to come up with some pretty pretty neat ideas. Uh, even even cars, uh, like fancy or uh, futuristic concept cars, things like that, are a really great thing, you know, because you, you can study the body lines and incorporate that into your, your design of your drawings for stuff like this. So that's almost what I think about when I did this, like, little flare on the shoulder right here. You know, I'd probably have like a little indent like this and have it light up or something like that on the character. I almost thought of like a flare in a, a hood scoop or something. And you just keep going on and on and keep picking at it and adding little drop shadows so that you can show like the recess of certain parts of it. And again, then you start going back to the glares and try to round out the, uh, the shapes a bit further. So on and so forth. Okay, so what else we got? Um, so you guys want to see torsos? Is that, that sound about right for a few people? We got torso shots. Let me see what else. Seems like all the content is placed on the left side of the page when it should be centered. Could just be me. Oh, you're talking about the, all right, forgive me. Yeah, the site placement is still left justified. That'll be next on my list. I, I did see what you meant there, Sifter, so I appreciate the uh, feedback. He's saying on the website that it's left justified when it should be centered to the page. Very correct. I'll fix that uh, hopefully later today. So, uh, hey, love your vid. Just got home. Oh, cool. Thank you for that. Is this an armored arm or a cybernetic prosthetic? Goodness, man, I can barely say that. Um, yeah, I don't know. You, you tell me. I, I was just kind of thinking something techy and futuristic for an arm, so I guess it could be either. Um, I always catch in the last hour of work. Yeah, sorry about that. No chest. No chest. Okay. All right. So, so the torso basically. So let me let me merge this down. So Command E, merge. Oh, this is Command E. There we go. Merge that down, move it over, and add a new layer. Okay, so the torso. Figures you guys would have to pick, like, you know, things that's not really my strong suit, but means I need to practice it anyway. So, all right, so the torso, the way that I always try to think about it and, and get some, like, contort or uh, twist in the torso is draw the the um, rib cage, abdomen. I guess rib cage, basically. Draw that like this with a line, Okay. And the reason why I think this helps versus getting in the habit of drawing the chest and then the stomach muscles and all that, you tend to compress it all a little bit too quickly. But if you do it like this where, you know, you you draw this uh, rib cage looking deal, you could even make it look dimensional if you wanted and do like this little deal. Uh, you don't have to, but that's just, again, just trying to paint a visual uh, 3D image in your head or whatever. You could do the side of it like that. 
And the beauty of doing it like this is it forces you, I think, to to contort it or twist it more. So like say I was gonna draw the pelvic, I'd draw that as a separate shape like this. And I'd make sure to really change the direction of it. So as you see, we're seeing the bottom of the torso there, but we're seeing the top of the pelvic or shape of the pelvic here. I mean, a little bit of the side, but not much. So what that does, get rid of my little arrow there, it, uh, it forces you to, again, contort, uh, contort it, <laughs> contort it, can't say that. And then uh, you take the shoulder line or the clavicles, collarbones, whatever you want to call them, put that on a uh, bend right there, put the shoulders here, make sure to have this shoulder kind of disappear so it uh, forces that perspective a little more. So you're able to stretch that. And then what I usually do for the stomach uh, is I'll do like a few separations. So I'm kind of picturing that these are the areas where it's bending. And you always want to make sure to compress one side and, and elongate the other side for, for dynamic poses. If you don't, it's going to look weird. So you got to remember that almost always one side is going to be a little bit more pinched. I think there's a name for this, uh, but it's like pinched on one side and extended on the other. So that's a big part of getting it right right there. And then, you know, after you get this part, um, you know, you can attach the other part. So you can go, okay, the chest is here. Uh, if you're looking up at the chest, remember to raise the pectoral muscles pretty high and make them look uh, shorter, you know, in height. That'll always kind of add emphasis to, uh, you know, the pose or the, the viewpoint being right on the front of the, uh, the stomach and sternum and all that. So, and then the other thing is you can just attach the head, attach the leg, put the leg over here. You know, it starts to become pretty easy to put the other parts on because, I don't know, you focused on, I would focus on the stomach and, you know, torso area first and get that bend in there. And, then the, you know, it's easier to kind of picture a dynamic uh, figure from there. You know, just put these little pieces on. And, and what I always think, is, what I think helps, uh, at least with me, as far as building a, a figure after the fact, is start with all these pieces being really thin. So I'll use like these little pointed shapes like this. Just get those in there first and figure it all out before you start trying to draw a muscle. Don't, don't come over here and try to draw the arm and go like this. I mean, maybe you can after some practice, but it's a sure way to kind of mess up, I think. I think it's better to put in these really simple shapes and get that other stuff in there. Block for the hand, little, you know, points for the fingers, just really the point and the direction they're going. Whatever, I don't know what this person's doing. They're doing some kind of uh, fight dance, something. But yeah, so so that's just, you know, obviously I'll, I'll back away from this because it's supposed to be just on the torso, but I just want to show you that once you get the torso in place like that, it becomes a lot easier to throw the rest of the stuff on there. Okay, and the female, uh, female torso, let me shrink this one down over, over the side. I know it's not the greatest sketch there, but I just want to keep everything that we do here. Okay, um, so the female torso, same thing. I mean, same concept. That could have easily been turned into a female torso other than the way I did the chest, obviously. But the only difference there is I would say that, um, let, me try, let me think of a different pose here. Let's do it more from the side a little bit. So I can show the arc, because that's I think that's a big part of getting the female torso right. So I'll do a slight bit of an angle like this. So again, here's that rib cage that I was talking about. Start with that. Let's get that motion or action line in there, and let's put a really uh, you know good bend to the spine there. So here's the pelvic sides of the legs. Now the way the legs will attach generally. The difference uh, from male to female in the pelvic shape will be more, the legs will appear like if I was to draw it forward facing. It's going to look a little bit more like this for the female pelvic and then a little bit more like this for the male pelvic. So it's good to think about it like that the openings, like I always talk about, you know, if you ripped your legs off your action figures, that kind of thing. Uh, it's going to look more like that. So that's the difference in a very basic rudimentary kind of way. That's the, the difference of the, uh, the pelvic area. And it just makes it a lot easier to kind of change the shape. So then you get the hourglass thing going on with the, the gals. 
and you know the really stubby <laughs> short pelvic or whatever you know like the where the muscles take over basically that's what I'm trying to say you get the abs in there or whatever God, I use some bad drawings okay so now back over to this bring this up you know we don't want to have it too elongated um, right here you want it seems like especially here because it's gonna again it's gonna pinch here come back this way and this is gonna be the elongated or stretched out curve right there and that's still too too tall I guess but um, but it's good to get that that bend in there you know that um, that pose needs to be really I, I don't know I always think of like dancing or um, when I get this from figure drawing it's you know characters in motion things like that then again if we want to start attaching parts or, or drawing more of it um, you know we could just put a leg up here really easy we could put a leg back this way we could put a shoulder here shoulder there one arm up here maybe one back you know and so on and so forth and again you could attach the head and and I think the upper body is way too tall right here so just take that I think tall and proportionally too large let me see if I can fix that. And now this is overly uh, stretched out. You know, I know a lot of people get like offended by this. I always like search images for reference and study, you know, other styles and things like that. And people always seem to get offended by this this thing that I'm doing here with the the overly accentuated curvature or whatever. And anatomy and things like that but I think that's so silly because we're drawing comics here we're not drawing uh, real life you know so uh, it makes sense that you would you would do all this you know to me I just I just think that's such a silly topic uh, when you see all that stuff and they're trying to make fun of it and, and show real people in the perception of comic poses and it's like yeah of course that doesn't make sense and it doesn't look right because it's not what not what people are drawing here. We're trying to draw animated, overly accentuated characters and figures and things like that. So I won't get too much into that, but it, it I don't know. I just think it's such a silly thing that people get so bent out of shape over that. Um, now, if we were sitting here trying to be uh, fine artists, then obviously we would want to really be accurate, but we're trying to draw comics. So we want to have fun with it and take it to uh, the next level of uh, animated or expressive kind of look, I guess. But so yeah, so this is how I do it, and I would just basically keep adding to it. So again, this is how I'd start with the torso, and then add the other components. Um, and it, you know, it's still a rough sketch. So as I keep progressing through it, I keep fixing things. The rib cage usually comes out like this, and then points back down, uh, depending on the angle. This, and you know, again, trying to get that bend in there. Maybe you see a little bit of the hip. I think this leg is way too far back. So I'll probably bring that forward. You know, and for that, always remember to draw through. Uh, it's something i got to remind myself of because I try to just skip over it and draw to the other side. And that's a surefire way to uh, have your lines not match up and uh, your artwork to look bad. So just draw through. It's easy enough to erase it back. Okay, let me read a couple more of these so I know I'm heading in the right direction that you guys want to see here. Uh, thanks from France. Oh, sweet. Appreciate that. Uh, I don't know how to say that, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. And Grayson, thanks for all your tutorials. Love watching you draw. Appreciate that. And what's K back saying? Okay, so if you're not a traditional oil painter, you can stylize your art and get away with it. Um, no, I mean, I wouldn't say that. I don't mean that. I mean, anybody can stylize their work and, and do whatever they want. I've seen some really amazing traditional painters that do a, a fantastic stylized representation. I just, it seems to be that, that they just put a really negative spin on, um, on comic artists that do it. Like, the, like it's such a horrible thing. Um, and again, I, I won't get too much into that because it, it brings up all that, you know, uh, back and forth kind of bickering and things like that but uh but essentially it just it just seems like that we're a lot more judgmental over uh 
what people what choices people make with their stylized representations and I, I don't particularly agree with that just because stylized work is just that it's stylized it's it's you're going to have these really uh, big differences in it in uh, proportions and structure and, and everything I mean you're stylizing it but that's kind of the fun in it I think I mean I think it's just really neat to see uh, what stuff you can come up with out of your out of your imagination like if I drag this over and show you my comic page you're gonna find hardly anything in this page that looks realistic I mean I don't think you've ever seen these guys before you know I mean if you have I'd like to meet them but um, you know it's just it's stylized you know I got a character he's got an alien on his back and he's he's a shiny black rock kind of creature I mean it's just a it's just totally stylized and imaginative um, so then it bothers me when somebody goes well look they didn't draw the the legs right or something it's like really it's, it's comics I mean I don't think you draw anything really right but I don't know it's it's just my opinion it's it's take it as you will you know but all right what else uh, what else do you guys want to see uh, do you want me to I keep doing torsos but I don't really know how much else I can explain other than you want to really stretch the pose that's kind of why I was showing you the head torso um, you know draw the rib cage and then the pelvic you want to stretch these three away from uh, away from themselves as much as possible so you do this little spine to connect them and then you want to practice seeing how far you can contort them and point them away from each other until it you know obviously doesn't look right uh, and again that's going to be a little bit uh, dependent upon your style and what you think is correct so I'm not going to tell you it doesn't look right you just got to play around with it um, but this is a really great way do a bunch of poses you first start off where you just do a bunch with just this the one two three kind of thing and uh, and there's a really great video that Jim Lee did uh, that talks about this so you look for that when you get a chance because that's actually where I think I picked this up and he did a fantastic job at explaining it and you know and then again you start throwing your your uh, limbs on that and it just becomes a lot easier to construct these uh, you still have to study from life. You still have to do some figure drawing. Uh, you should do figure drawing at least, I don't know, every other day. You know, it's a good thing to like actually start your day with. Do some warm-ups and do some, um, you know, couple minute studies of people just doing random things. Uh, and don't don't all don't all only do uh, people fighting and, and jumping and combating. Do people sitting at the table drinking coffee? Do people lounging around the house you know you got to draw all these different things uh, so that you've got a good understanding of of all of it you know to tell your story okay hands yeah we can work on hands if you guys would like so let's see actually let me let me pull up a couple hand poses to look at um, on my other system here because hands can be tricky I'll show first I'll show you the basic way that I approach them almost every time and then I'll look at a few for studies lately I've been struggling with uh, with this I don't know why I was just, just been struggling with this lately but um, so hands themselves I usually start with a wedge shape so again uh, let's just start with a foreshortened one where it's coming out towards camera a bit and I'll start with the wedge of the hand or the blocky part I'll picture the opening of the fingers like this so I picture they, they bend a bit they're not straight across and actually the pinky tucks down a bit further like this the thumb comes off to the side and the thumb can, you know is opposing so it can move in its own direction and I always draw the pad with the thumb so that I can kind of picture you know the knuckle that's in the hand that you don't see as much and then the two that come out or well one more knuckle and then the last point of the thumb and what I try to do whenever I do this is is try to just get the direction of the fingers first so if I want this hand pose where they're kind of reaching out towards camera for instance and then I always try to remember that the pinky takes its own direction too so these middle fingers kind of always stick together the pointer finger will, will go in its own direction a little bit and the pinky will usually tuck down in its own direction so it's good to notice like those little things because it keeps you from just doing hands that you know you always see this where somebody does a hand and all the fingers are going in the same direction and they might even get the height difference right so the height taper is like this one's shorter obviously this starts to taper in the pinky smaller they might get that right 
but the hands very rarely are all going in the same direction like that. Um, so that's that's one thing that I try to always pay attention to when I'm drawing the hands. And then let me soft erase this down. And that thumb's up too high. I gotta fix that. So the thumb would actually come back and probably down this way at this kind of pose. So I think the tricky part about a pose like this is looking through it. So sometimes it's better to start at the front and work back. So that'll help me sometimes with like foreshortening. I'll start with the, the front of the finger uh, and work back. And a lot of times you just have to redraw it a few times to get things placed correctly. So again, the, the ring finger here, that pinky finger. I have that kind of pointing downward. Again, kind of going in its own direction. The pad of the thumb here. Uh, the other thing, the tricky part with the thumb is sometimes it bends this way, or it doesn't bend this way, but from this angle, you'll get more of the inside it pointing out, I guess. And again, this is where having a picture of it's probably better for something like this because it kind of reminds you of all the, uh, like I've got the pinky in a little bit too tight right there. So let's soft erase again, and I might do like, Try to paint it or draw it visually so I'll get like a little bit of the wrist in there just to kind of, you know, perceive a little bit better what's going on here. Soft erase it down again. The thumb still looks funny. The fingers look a bit small by comparison to the hand, I think. So let's see here. Finger coming up. So I'll just keep trying to refine it, um, and then if, if worse comes to worse, I'll jump right to reference when it comes to hands because, for instance, a really quick way to get this pose just right is to use like the uh, camera on your tablet or your, uh, you know, I got one on my uh, laptop here, and take a picture of the hand like this doing the same pose, and then I'll quickly find out what's uh what's bothering me about this, what's so wrong with it. So I don't waste any time when it comes to something like that. Like, don't get me wrong, eventually I want it to be where I never maybe have to look at a picture. But it's, uh, if I'm not there, I'm not going to beat myself up over it. I'm going to pull from reference, get it done quicker and more effectively and, and uh, move on to something else. There's too many things to worry about drawing when it comes to the body. And when you're doing a, a full book and you know, complex poses and foreshortening and dynamic anatomy and all this stuff, it's like you, you really can't afford to waste the time. If you're struggling with it, then just move on. Like I, I could call this good enough. It's not a horrible hand, but it could definitely be better. Um, but that's where I would start looking at reference. And the other thing is, is, is when I start to draw stuff like this, I, I do just a bunch of warm-ups. So I'll draw... A few poses of just hands if I'm struggling with that that day or whatever I'm struggling with and uh, and then I just that's the thing I need to study that day I guess so I'm gonna look at a picture on a screen now and draw another pose and let's see which one would be a good good one to do here one sec I want to find a decent shot that I can uh, all good reference here. Okay, I'll do this one where the hand's kind of uh, coming out towards you and it's cupped a little bit. So this is a tricky one. Let me read a couple of these comments real quick. Uh, let's see. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Hands gripping objects. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll do that. Okay, and then Sifter says, either you earlier you mentioned you, uh, studying robotic shapes from pictures, and I feel it can limit creativity as it doesn't allow fresh new ideas to happen. You're basically using other people's ideas. Okay, that's I mean that's one way to look at it, Sifter. But you got to figure that your creativity, your your ideas that you're talking about, your fresh ideas, that's coming from things that you've seen previously in your imagination, and you're just pulling it from your shit. Uh, you know, changing it based on whatever ideas you're you're feeling that day. So that's that's true in a sense, but the other part is you have to learn to look at things around you, 
pull from it uh, in one direction and then use your creativity to, to, to change it. I'm not saying copy it verbatim, I'm saying to study a certain component of it. So if you look at uh, really advanced paintings or really advanced uh, artistic renderings, whatever, you're going to notice that they, they have so many different things going on correctly with their work. You have to start to realize that they're not just doing that all out of their brain. They're, they're a lot of great artists, and I've met plenty to, sit, to attest to this, know when to pull a certain dynamic from a certain thing and to make it their own. So it's a, it's a composition of a, a series of ideas that makes a great piece. Um, and maybe some, some uh, fantastic savants out there can do it entirely out of their head, but I, I know a lot of them will pull uh, specific components from various things. All right, so let's see what else. Uh, I started drawing when I was a kid because I was watching Dragon Ball Z and I just wanted to draw the characters. Yeah, that's cool. There's, that's inspiration. I, I, I've done the same thing. I remember Transformers got me pumped when I was a kid. It still does, but uh, it seems like the movies are getting worse and worse. But the the uh, old cartoon was just like prolific for me and wanting to draw and things like that. So was he, man. Don't judge me. All right, so... The drawings were awful, but it got me going. <laughs> nice. I thought you were talking about mine. I'm like, ouch. But yeah, it's it's fine. I mean, as long as the, it gets you creatively spiked and, and you're into it, that's that's cool. Uh, okay, and then uh, Roger's got a cool one. There's an Android app called Handy that shows all kinds of hand positions in a 3D way that works great for artists. That's fantastic. I didn't know about that. So yeah, everybody check that out. Um Felix says, hey, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but you always need mind. Wait, but you always need mindful of references in mind to draw stuff right away. Yeah, so, so yeah, for sure. I mean, you have to have references to, uh, to get through a job quicker, especially if you're working as a professional. Um, I've had deadlines where I had to pump stuff out in a day. And if you're not feeling your creativity that day and you're not drawing as well, uh, you really can't subject your client to that. You have to, like, sometimes pull from reference and get through it. So I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. And, and the more you work professionally, you'll see that. But it's like drawing a city. You know, I, can I draw a city from my mind? Yes. Am I going to miss some things? For sure. You know, can I pull from a, an image and get it a lot closer and still stylize it? Definitely. And that's, the, you know, that's what you have to kind of focus on. Okay, so I was going to do this cupped hand thing, but somebody mentioned hand holding an object, which is a lot more um, important, I would say, for comics. So let me let me find a, a hand holding an object. Uh, I guess I could just Google it, so I'm going to sit here and search through a bunch of hands. Um, hands holding objects. Okay, so here's one. So essentially, um, you know, what's good here is if you do some kind of object or placement first. So let's say that, I don't know, this could be a sword or, uh, I don't know, a dowel or some, anything. But and let's have the hand uh, grabbing this. So let me actually take this, let's do a new layer, convert it to a blue line. Okay, so let's have the hand going around the object. So... Let's do the pad of the thumb right here. Let's have the wedge of the, the hand like this, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to go behind it, but we'll do this blocky shape behind it, or that's supposed to be behind it. The pad of the thumb here, and then the point in the direction of the finger, so you got the knuckle here, the point of the thumb there, and you've got the other knuckle to the pointer finger here, and then the finger goes around, and comes back and each one of these do this so you can just draw these little stick man kind of things to kind of get the direction uh, again you can draw through it just to kind of visualize in your mind uh, what they're doing but you can you know quickly soft erase those areas back you just want to figure out where the, uh, the end of the fingers end like this so again I'll draw the one up close first so I'll get the thumb in here this, have it widen out as it connects to the hand. So you got the knuckle of the thumb right there. And the end of the fingers here. And 
And again, the, the main thing I think is that you just want to give each of them a little bit different direction. That's really important. Like, you know, you'll see a lot of times when the, the hand's wrapping around something, you'll get like barely the pinky. So, you know, it's, it's just important to do that. And the other way to kind of show direction, these fingers look a little bit too tucked in there, like they need to be further out. Grab just this. More like that. But the other, uh, the other thing that's really nice about doing the fingers, uh, especially if they're not gloved, I still do this even when I draw a gloved character. I'll do the the fingernails because it's easy to draw those in and kind of visualize uh, a bit more of the depth. So I'll just do the little wedges of the fingernails or whatever, and that always helps me kind of visualize the uh, the shape of the fingers a little bit better. The actually you need to tuck back in more. So I'm thinking since the uh, there's more room here, the fingers look like they would be longer. I'll just draw more of the top segment of this finger right here, and bring it back this way. Something like that. That, and then at the top of the hand here, maybe a bend to the wrist here, and the wrinkles you get from the hand right there. All right, just trying to look over these comments real quick. Including what shadows you can turn, pan, and zoom the hand pose. Oh, cool. Still talking about the app there. Can you include a bit of explanation for line weight in the next drawing? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so the tricky part I'm seeing here is like getting the, you know, and notice I'm just soft erasing everything back each time. So all these sketch lines kind of add up, and you just got to keep making decisions as you uh, as you do this. You know, like. What things don't look right? What things can I fix right now? And uh, can I make it better? You know, it's 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 just tricky. You know, it's sometimes it you immediately get something right. Other times you just got to keep redrawing. It's just the uh, the nature of it. You know, like uh, when people always ask me, like you know, how do I get better at this stuff? Uh, how long is it going to take me? Things like that. I always come back and, and let them know that hey, just just remember that drawing is hard work. You know, it's. I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that drawing is, is not necessarily easy. Everybody knows that it's not easy. That's why people respect a good artist uh, so much uh, for their talents and things. But it's. Uh, it's just not. It's not easy in the the idea of it being some overnight process. It's. It's hard work. It's. It's hours and hours and years of dedication to become a great artist. So. Uh, don't beat yourself up when something's not drawn right immediately because, you know, it's, it's just going to take quite a while to develop all these different things, to draw all these different parts of the body well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not there by any, any stretch of the imagination yet. You know, it's like I'm a work in progress like we all are. So just keep, uh, keep at it and don't beat yourself up. So something like that. I mean, obviously it could be better. I don't even know that the the thumb would be uh, right there, but I think it would. I ended up changing it from the photo that I'm looking at. And that's the other thing, too, is to, to be okay with studying photos, but then, you know, to be able to make those changes. All right, so we're going to talk about line weight a little bit because that was the next question. And what else we got here? Can you draw uh, extra dynamic poses like someone's swimming or flying uh, directly at you or something 
Oh, man, just go for the toughest thing imaginable, huh? Thanks, Talon. Um, in Michael Hampton's book, he talks about looking for T overlaps, which indicate where to increase and decrease line thicknesses accordingly. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I haven't checked out that book, so I'm just going to give you my uh, explanation of that, and it may or may not be right. So let me toggle these off. Um, I guess I might be able to use... Yeah, you know what, I'll duplicate this one and I'll use this to explain it, um, if you guys don't mind. So it'll save me a little bit of drawing there. Okay, so let's take this and blue line it one more time. And let me explain to you what I think, and I, I could be wrong, but I'm just going to give you a couple of my uh, ideas of why I think uh, you add line weight in certain areas and things like that. Okay, so with something like this, this is obviously a basic static up and down shot, but I would add line weight a couple ways. One of which, uh, there's a couple things. One is one thing is I always go back and forth all the way around the object. Okay, so this could be considered random. Uh, a lot of times I'll add line weight if I'm trying to reinforce the the feel of it with a shadow and there's a strong light source up top. I'll purposely add the line weights to the bottom of objects to reinforce the the, again the light coming from the top kind of thing now other artists uh, I've heard talk about this uh, one in particular I can remember was a, a demonstration that McFarlane gave Todd McFarlane and he said that he adds the the heavier line weight on the the utmost curve of the object so I guess based on what I, I perceived him saying or understood him saying is he would add it to the areas where it bows out the, mo the most like this so there's, there's a few different ways to do that. Now the other thing about line weight is this. Generally in comics, when you're doing line weight, and somebody just talked about foreshortening, let's say that, um, let's say that there's you know, a hand coming out. We'll do a fist just to make it easy. Somewhat easy. Like I said, I've been struggling with fists lately. I don't get it. Um, thumbs up here somewhere like this. So here's our, here's our fist. It's going to be real shorthand. Get it? Shorthand? Anybody? No. Probably not. Okay. And then the forearm here, like this. You know, whatever. Shoulder back here. Generally, from a, a per, uh, perspective shot like this, you'll get very little of the upper arm. Uh, it just depends on how you draw it, I guess. But usually, it seems like you'll just get a little bit of the bicep. You probably wouldn't even see the tricep from this angle. The forearm and the fist would take up most of the page so there's there's a quick foreshortened shot right and the shoulder actually looks like it goes this way kind of at an angle okay so that's our our rough sketch of that but then where would you add the line weight to this you know wh how would you make this stand out even further uh, a lot of times in comics you're gonna just add this really heavy line weight closer towards camera so this is your way to make things look like they're jumping off the page so you had this big, heavy, I'm going to do it real kind of fat and ugly at first just to kind of get it in place. But I would do this real heavy line weight on the fist and even heavier on the areas that are maybe on the bottom or like, you know, the curvature outward or whatever. So I'd give it this big kind of gaudy outline around it like this. I don't want to spend too much time trying to detail this, but I want to make sure you can see what I'm talking about. You know, there's some lines right here, whatever. Okay, so, and then next, I would work back, and I'd say, okay, well, I still want a pretty heavy line weight here. I want movement in the line. So what I consider movement in the line is that the line isn't the same all the way around. It's not this type of line which is going to look very boring and very flat. Uh, instead, I want movement in the line, so I want, I want it heavier here. And I want it to thin out maybe right there when it connects here so that now this line looks impressive. And then likewise, when I get back to here, I might have to revisit uh, the fist area and really bump up the line weight because I want this to look like it's coming out towards camera. I want it to look like, you, you know, I, I think about it like this. We don't with comics we don't have as much to draw things uh, in focus or not in focus like a like a digital painter could do with Photoshop or something or like a photographer could do with their images 
Um, so you, ha you kind of have to control that with the way you use your shadows and the way that you use your line weight. Um, so I would, I would do this heavier line around the fist, you know, even to the, like I said, even to where it looks a bit gaudy, because that's going to help it to look a lot more, you know, in your face, kind of dimensional. And then there's other tricks, you know, like I said, with the shadows, you might do a, a pretty heavy shadow down here to intentionally make this pop out more. You could do a line break in the, um, the panel, you know, something like that. And then you could even reinforce that with some motion lines. So all of a sudden you're able to like really, you know, kind of bring this out and add a little bit more depth and, and focus I guess or whatever on the uh, the punch here or whatever this is you know hand coming out towards the camera so does that kind of explain line weight a little bit better with the where you can add the thick to thins so there's there's the area where it can be in shadow uh, so you could do the shadow part of the form uh, I kind of like it where it, it does it gets a little bit larger towards the, the rounded most part the part extending out and then tapers back and then I also like the idea of where it's it's considered movement in the line so that all the way around the character it just kind of because I've seen people that do this where they'll do thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. I mean it's almost like that's all they're thinking about. But I would take it a step further and I would make sure that you also think about objects that are closest to uh, to the viewer. I forgive my bad sketches here, but it's it's almost what I have to do to explain things quickly enough and then uh, get enough information in these. Like we're already at 52 minutes. I can't I can't believe how fast these go by. Okay, so I'm not seeing any more comments. Is there any more questions from you guys? I'm seeing more comments below, but I can't. I'm just scroll down there. All right, waiting for some more questions. Um, if not, I'll, I'll start to bring this one to a close. Um, so let me know if you guys got any last things you'd like me to uh, approach. Okay, I have one. <laughs> okay, what is it? <laughs> you took the time to say, okay, I have one, or oh, I have one. What is it? Gotta love these delays, man. I can't wait till the live streams get a bit better where they're instantaneous. That'd be awesome. One day. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions, so um, so yeah, let me move this stuff over. Hopefully, this explained a bit. I know it gets a little bit. Uh, oh, hold on. Can you draw at least three futuristic buildings and explain your thought process on how you do them? Um, I could do a rough sketch of some futuristic buildings, but I can't um, draw three fully detailed or whatever. Uh, like how you go about making them different. Got it. Okay, so let me do this. I'll do a quick sketch of some futuristic buildings and just give you a little bit of what goes into that. So the first thing I would do is perspective. So I'd figure out you know where these buildings are going to sit uh, in relationship to you know the horizon line so just always remember that a horizon line up top means you're looking down at objects like this you know so that's a building whatever uh, and then a horizon line that's low means you're looking up at, at the objects a two point uh, vanishing point is going to make you an object that looks uh, distorted in the field of view kind of thing or this is actually a three point, sorry, because these would all converge up top. So we'll, we'll do this kind of effect for a, a futuristic building. And one surefire way to make a futuristic building not look futuristic is just to do a block square like I just did here. So that's the first thing you have to get rid of. You know, you want to start with this to get things in place, but then you want to hurry up and, and change it and, and try to make it not so blocky and boring. And there's lots of ways to do that. I mean, you can do like uh, just shapes that come off it and, and change that blockiness to a, a 
a bit more of these weird angles and chops and you know different little designs in the building almost like the same concept they used for that that robot looking drawing you know you could do like these dimensional breaks in the building like this but all of it kind of goes back to the same perspective and then the other thing that you want to do is try to find areas where you can just not use angles altogether I think I mean it depends on what type of style you're after uh, and then the other thing is to remember with buildings is one of the best ways to convey size is to figure out where you can add tiny little details so for instance if I had these big blocky windows over here like this this building doesn't look very large and it doesn't look very well thought out or anything but if I get in there and I add these tiny little windows and then variations of breaks and, and trim work and whatever um, it'll it'll start conveying size pretty quickly I mean, this is gonna be really crude but hopefully you'll get the idea um, so yeah and I'll do like you know maybe windows going this way then windows going this way and then just separations of shapes so this is a pretty boring looking futuristic building one of the things that I do for mine is I'll do like a, for one I thumbnail everything I probably should have started there especially when it comes to cities so I'll do like a very thumbnail version and I do like all these like I don't know weird shapes I guess I might do all these like points and antenna looking things coming off it and then like I said, one of the things that's best to try to do is to try to get some different things than you're used to seeing. So you might have, I don't know, a platform type thing coming off over here and some of these little antenna looking things or, or whatever, you know. Um, I mean, I don't want to say that you have big wires coming off it or something like that, but, you know, you got to think of like different ideas that you haven't seen before. That's the hard part. Uh, and then you also want to try to put in some different uh, types of shapes like I'm trying to think where I can add a circle or a half moon or something but you want something where it just isn't a square so a bit almost like more organic and less angular um, which I'm not really thinking of anything cool right now so again if we took this perspective this way from the vanishing point I'm just scribbling because I'm trying to like think of an idea here. Do some uh, size relationship stuff so you can put like little little trees down here, and again, it helps convey like this feeling that this is a, a large kind of structure. And, and this is really where thumbnailing is so important because, um, you know like this I'm not getting any great ideas right now and I don't want to look at reference because you guys will think I'm a bad person but you know it's uh it, it's where thumbnailing is really important so this is where taking an image uh, you guys I don't know if you could tell size relationship what this is this is about a one by one maybe a maybe a two inch square on my um, my screen not even really a square but then you want to try to get as much information so same thing with like you know perspective get it in there and then you want to like just block in these shapes and this is what I'll do for cities a lot of times because I don't know it seems like it frees me up to kind of think of something different than I'm that I might normally draw when I'm drawing so small where I can't get too much into the details I can only focus on like the shapes of it and an idea more or less so I'll just draw like these really crude looking shapes and I'll try to like work out ideas so maybe I've got one that's up close here I'll darken that in to show that you know these structures are really up close to camera um, but this is where I would try to start I would start with the idea process like this and try to figure out as much as you can you know I mean you just get little bits of detail in there but thumbnail a bunch of these ideas down first and you, you know if, you'll probably come up with something a little bit more uh, impressive by the time you get to your your detailing stage and let's see and then as far as let's try shape first so I'll just do like more of a trace and 
Or a silhouette first, I mean. Again, I always want to put these little antenna things up there just for almost more size relationships. And then maybe have it widen out differently at the base. Put a few little people by it. And then maybe for the windows, we do just like some ovals instead of squares. I mean, you can't really see that these are ovals, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, instead of just doing the traditional square windows, maybe there's just like little stretched out ovals. Another structure in front of it so it doesn't look so flat. But yeah, so that's that's essentially, you know, hopefully it gives you some ideas. I know those are pretty weak, but that's really how I would do it. I would just keep working on some different shapes until something clicks, you know, until the ideas start flowing. And if force going to worse, I'll look at some darn reference. <laughs> um, all right, let me read a couple more of these. Like, how do you go about making them different? Hopefully the, the shape thing explained that. I'm using an old school tablet. Have you ever used one? I'm finding it very difficult to draw looking at the screen and not looking down at my hands. Yeah, that does take time. I used a regular tablet for about three, maybe four years. Um, and basically, you are just you just have to keep working at it. There's actually reasons why the tablet that you use on your lap, or I set it on my lap, you can set it on the table and look up at the screen, has some strengths that outweigh, I'm using a Cintiq right now, uh, but there's times when the regular tablet actually beats the Cintiq. Uh, it's better, in my opinion, sometimes for digital painting, sculpting, um, and just, just really even thumbnailing like we just did here, like ideas. You just you have to get used to it being a little bit more free of a process and a drawing uh, uh, way of drawing. You know, than a, a just think about it like this. When you draw and you're, you're, you know exactly where you want the line to go, that's one way of creating. Another way of creating is where you don't care as much about the specific way the line is put down and you're just letting it kind of free form. So digital painters work a lot in that way and that's where a regular tablet I think will actually outperform a Cintiq because you get too much in the habit of thinking specifically where your lines or your color or whatever is going to go and sometimes you you don't let creativity take over in that way. Um, what else? Uh, that first building is okay. Could you could be an old rundown <laughs> building for all we know. Nice. Um, are your brushes for this app on Gumroad yet? Um, so I've got brushes for Clip Studio uh, and Manga Studio on uh, on my Gumroad. Yes, I've got a few different sets. There's one set that's a current work in progress, but you get it now and you get the brushes as I'm updating them. And by pre-supporting, uh, you actually get it for half price. So that's on my Gumroad right now, and I'll. You know, you guys can find my Gumroad through any of my links or whatever. I'll make sure it's in the description box below. Uh, what else? So, Rob, in your opinion, uh, to draw exotic backgrounds doesn't involve looking at life uh, or looking at life and just trying to add your own spin on it. Yeah, so so what I think there, when you're doing like science fiction backgrounds or any of that, uh, or any, any sci-fi type stuff, I think that all of it works better if you use references from life, but then you change them. Or, or combine them like for instance if you take a building but you look at plants or insects and you try to combine certain components of that into your buildings even I know it sounds strange but if you look there's a lot of artists that do stuff like that and they do it really well and sometimes so well to where you're, you're just looking at it and appreciating the artwork but you don't realize that they're uh, that what they were studying was actually something that you know some underwater creature from the depths you know it, there's a lot of things like that, and a lot of artists will talk about that as they, they explain the process, and it makes total sense. So what happens is it resonates to you as a viewer a little bit better because you're like, wow, that's so cool. I don't know why it's cool, but I, you know, it clicks in your mind that you've seen it before or whatever you relate to it. So there's, there's ways to do that, and not to mention that there's so much information in, in studying nature and, and life around you that you're going to get these really great food for thought ideas because of that. There's just so much. You know, you look at uh, nature and you're going to get so much information and data from that. So it's, it's 
using that and creating your own spin uh, that makes really great sci-fi work in my opinion. Uh, let's see, since I'm into sci-fi-ish related stuff like Star Wars, yeah, yeah, Star Wars is great. You know, you can see a lot of that in there. You know, a lot of the creatures and characters. I mean, look at the characters that they do for the backgrounds. A lot of them look like insects. A lot of them look like, you know, something that's got lobster hands or whatever. You know, they're, it's not specifically really brand new ideas if you think about it. I mean, the way that they put it all together is definitely uh, creative and, and amazing and fantastic and all those things. But... They definitely all have very definable uh, relationships to things that we have already seen. All right, so hopefully that's helped you guys and been an interesting live stream. We're a little over an hour, so I'm going to bring it to a close. Remember that you can check out my Gumroad and my Patreon and things like that and support the work that I do here. Uh, if you want to keep seeing me produce new content, that allows me to do so. And I appreciate everybody taking the time to be part of this and uh, watching and, and looking at my bad drawings and stuff. So thanks very much for that. So as always, keep drawing, keep having fun, and I will talk to you soon.